I missed it the first time, but got it on the rebound. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogley's Guitar Show. About a year, year and a half ago, a set of really cool rare color guitars shown up. One of them had a refinished back of the neck, so I wasn't that interested in it. But the other one was supposed to be really clean, and it got away from me. But I just found it on eBay, and I was able to get it for the price that I wanted it for the first time. So it all worked out in the end. And it's been an incredibly long time, like since I first started buying guitars and whatnot since I've had this model. So let's go ahead and document this rare color of the Gibson L6S. L6 Midnight Special is the official title of this one. You might have seen these on Reverb before, but you probably haven't seen this really cool burgundy sparkle finish. I've never seen it in person before either, and I am enamored right now. I always thought this particular finish looked kind of bad in photos, but I guess to fully understand this beast, we need to do a brief little history rundown. So in 1972, Gibson introduced this weird thing. This is known as an L5S. It was basically a Gibson L5, but created in a solid body format. So you didn't have to worry about any feedback. You can have all the electric stuff that you want. You can check out this full review and demo to learn a little bit more about this particularly interesting one. So the year after that, we had the introduction of this model, the L6S. Now they might have similar names, but they're constructed very differently. Basically, that's where the similarities end. They both look like flat and pancake last balls. <laughs> So the year after the L5S introduction, they came out with the L6S. But if you go through Gibson history, you have things like the Melody Makers, the Juniors and the Specials that were supposed to be like the student grade model guitars. And then in the early 70s, the Melody Maker eventually became the SG100, 200. So I suppose you could look at these as a kind of stripped down version of that. However, it's not super ultra low end. So the very first year of L6S production, they look like this. The first 200 or so got pretty cool block inlays and then they switched them over into dots, which is what you will see on pretty much everything. But the year following that, they decided to introduce a deluxe model. And then at that time, the L6S was renamed the L6S Custom because these were a Bill Lawrence collaboration. These pickups right here, they were designed by him. Now the Custom might look like it has two volumes and a tone and some sort of a veritone switch on it. However, it's actually a master volume with a mid roll off as well as a treble roll off. And then your chicken head rotary knob here acts very similar to a veritone. You can get a whole bunch of different tones. But this new deluxe was completely different. It had a string through body design. It had a radical different pick guard. It didn't have a veritone. I believe it still had the same pickups, but it had a regular selector switch on it and then just a master volume and a regular tone. So those were the main models of the L6S and they lasted until the early 80s. However, there was another model within this family that kind of blent the two specs together. This is known as the L6 Midnight Special. For whatever reason, it did not have the S in the title officially. And these were a little bit more stripped down and named after a TV show that was popular at the time. So what do I mean by stripped down? They're actually bolt-on necks. And as far as I can tell, this is the very first Gibson bolt-on neck guitar that is a solid body electric. So we kind of have the deluxe layout here as far as it being a string through design. We still have the Bill Lawrence pickups. But besides being a bolt-on neck, the other unique feature here is we actually have a plain Gibson headstock. Now, Gibson eventually kind of built upon this idea with the Marauders and the S1s, but these were brand new under the Norlin ownership, likely produced to create a budget model version of this. But of the Midnight Specials, the coolest ones have to be the Sparklies. So you can find this one, the Burgundy, and then there's also a Cream Sparkle. I believe it's officially known as Glitter White. So naturally, 70s guitar with sparkle finish, yeah, it's going Going to be collectible today, but surprisingly these don't sell for crazy premiums. It's not like the Sparkle Top Deluxe that sell for 10 grand plus nowadays, whereas a regular Deluxe is like three or four. I mean, there still is a premium associated with these, but it's not as big as you might think. So I really do want to find a nice clean cream sparkle for my collection too, because this one's actually in really good shape. I mean, outside of a small ding right here, slightly larger one right here, and it looks like one replaced knob. I mean, this thing is great. Now you might have noticed that this pick guard looks different than some of the other L6 Midnight Specials we've been seeing on the screen. The one on this one is more so stylized after the Deluxe. However, typically the Midnight Special looks like this. You can actually find both of the iteration on these glitter finishes. So there are some variations in between just the cool finishes. So if you're a collector, there are quite a few of these to get. 
because even the regular L6S, they came in so many different iterations. There's a lot of colors. You could find every single fretboard imaginable on that model. I mean, the Midnight Specials, you could only find them in maple. As far as the custom goes, you could find it with an ebony board. You could find it with a rosewood as well as maple. So that's something else that makes these kind of unique. A maple fretboard on a Gibson. This was very new at the time as far as being mass produced. So to learn more about this unique L6 Midnight Special, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench to take a look at its parts and specs. If you guys thought I was nervous taking apart this guitar because of how beautiful clean it is, let me tell you, I am actually way more nervous about this one because these pickups, if they look like this, chances are they're original. Be very careful. These use ultra thin wires and when they snap, you cannot fix them. So here we go. That's what I'm talking about. They are thin wires and as they age, they get very brittle. One slight tug, not even a hard tug, just a little boop and they snap straight off. And because these are epoxy coated on the back, you just can't fix these. But here's what the backside of one of these Bill Lawrence designed pickups look like. And here's what the pickup cavity of an L6 Midnight Special looks like. Nothing too fancy in here, to be honest. The bridge pickup, I don't dare take any further because look how that was attached from the factory. Just a little bit of bare wire showing right there. But inside here, we can see the maple body without any finish on it. So that was kind of cool. And here's what the backside of that bridge pickup looks like as well. As far as the cover condition on these, Looks like the string made an impression on that at one point in time, but for the most part, not too bad. You cannot replace the covers on those simply because of the whole epoxy coating process. All right, nerve wracking part of the episode over. Let's make sure it still works. Bridge pickup that reads 6.45K ohms, a neck position reading 6.4, and our middle position for fun, 3.59. So everything's peachy here. They're actually a little bit lower wind than a traditional PAF. I also had a hard time deciding, should I clean this guitar? Should I not? Like there was definitely some fingerprints on it, but this is not a full gloss. It's almost like a semi gloss. And if we actually move on to the neck, this started life completely satin, just like the face of the headstock here. It still has that satin feel to it. As a player would play it, it would naturally buff into a gloss. That's why a lot of people don't realize these actually started as satin finishes. So if I took my scratch remover and really went to town, I think this would buff up a little bit more than it has already. So I decided, since this is already a surviving example, I was just gonna lightly wipe it down and all the glitter really came into effect here. Cause that's really what this is. It's not a metallic finish necessarily. They just threw glitter sparkle flakes in with it on top of a wine red finish. And it is a three piece maple body. Like if you really start to look at it, you can see one seam line right here. And I think the other lines right here, it's easier to see on the back. This body actually has some interesting flame figuring within it as well. And I decided it's a see-through pick guard. What do we really need to take that thing off for? Also, if you get it in the light just right, you can actually see there's quite a bit of finish checking within this as well. But it's just a regular three-way toggle switch. So we have very basic tones here, neck, bridge, and then both of them together with a master volume and a master tone. Now, luckily, in my parts drawer, I actually have the exact knobs I need. So here's my options. I can take both of these off and just put it with two error correct ones that will match the aging perfectly, or I can see which one matches it the best. But there's our output jack on the front of this model. And of course, we gotta take a look at our harmonica bridge. It's just a wide travel bridge that Gibson used very briefly in the 70s. You can find a few early 80s models with them as well. A lot of times their slotted adjustment screws right here will become so chewed up over the ages you can't actually use them. So having this one be clean just shows you how little this one was actually used. But they were Schaller made, they had studs in the body. But you have to remember, this was before the Nashville bridge came out. That was around 1975-ish. And here we can see our six string ferrules that go through the body. But speaking of the body, people think these are flattened Les Pauls because, I mean, they are relatively thin guitars. The thickest area they are right up here by the neck is 1.3 inches. And even though it feels thinner down here, it measures just about the same. But also remember, you have some comfort carves on the back as well as a little bit of a swoop right here. So that does feel thinner towards the middle. But now we can move on from our maple body to our maple neck. So a Kalamazoo built maple neck bolt-on guitar. Yes, they did exist. 
So this one has the dot inlays, and as I was telling you earlier, this still has the satin finish on the fretboard. However, what's interesting here, you see this? That's where somebody's finger and or fingernail was dragging as they were playing the guitar. And you're probably wondering, hey Trogly, why didn't you clean this off? Well, A, it's because I don't want to buff the finish any further than it already has. And B, I did wipe it down. That's not actually dirt, that's just buffed areas of finish. <laughs> so it's kind of cool that this one has a portion of the fretboard that was virtually untouched by anybody, so you can see what it looked like originally from the factory, but up through the 14th fret, it does show some polished areas. And if you're questioning why I didn't polish the frets, same reason. If I start polishing the frets, the areas right around the frets will get buffed up during that process. And yeah, you can mask it off, but you're always going to get a little bit of rub anyways. It still utilizes a 24 and 3 quarter inch scale length, but this was also another first for Gibson with a solid body electric guitar. Can you tell me what it is? 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 frets. Yeah, it's a full two octave scale. You don't find that on too many Gibsons even yet today. But a characteristic of these guys are their very thin nut widths, 1.58 inches. And holy cow, 1.95 by the 12. <laughs> That's a really skinny neck. But you run into that a lot in the early 70s. Our first fret neck depth is 0.81, but pretty rounded at 0.96 by the 12. Here's what that neck profile looks like at the 1st fret and the 12th fret. You can see just how rounded of a neck profile it is, but then it has like a flatness right here, so it's almost like a D shape, but it really just feels like a really deep C neck profile despite what that looks like there. And you're also going to notice that it's not just a maple neck with frets in it, they actually still do have a maple fretboard that they join on top of the neck, that way they can put the truss rod in it, instead of having to do a fender skunk stripe. It's also worth mentioning those are tortoise shell colored markers on the side, even though they just look black. You gotta get them in the light just right to see the red. This is a really good one to look at for that. Moving on to our headstock here. You can see all the pieces of wood. The reason why this is plain is because they didn't put any type of a veneer, they didn't do any finishing on here, they just slapped a logo on it, and you can see the logo is slightly cracked, and that's just because the wood expands and contracts depending on what kind of conditions it's stored in, and the decal doesn't move, so it gets ripped. So you can see the three pieces of the maple neck as well as the wings on the front, but our truss rod is looking perfect and our satin finish is still intact up here. The truss rod covers are also kind of cool on these things. So the L6S actually had that embossed into this, but this one's just a pretty chunky, big plastic one that doesn't have any branding on it. But those truss rod covers start to change towards the later 70s, where they just get their usual style. Moving on to the backside now, here's that comfort carve I was talking about. So they are a slightly sculpted body. I was appreciating the flamed figuring of the body over here under my spotlight. It is kind of cool that you still have the wood grain underneath it. I mean, this is basically just a wine red finish that's rather thin that they threw a whole bunch of glitter over top of. So you still get the wooden characteristics that make each guitar unique. So like this one has a little bit of flame figuring right there as well. And normally with metallic finishes, it's actually a solid color, whereas this one's still translucent, so it's pretty cool. And you'll notice the ferrules through the body, they don't actually come out the end, so they're just like little metal inserts at the top. That way you're not cutting through the wood with string tension over the years. But the fact that they don't go all the way through the body, it masks them a little bit, because unless you get it in the light, you don't even see them. But it makes it really difficult to restring these because... <laughs> When you're trying to put it through, it catches on the lip that's on the inside, so you gotta poke it around until you finally get through, but that's just how they are. The Deluxe had a much better system on the back. Everything is looking stock and untouched here. I thought it was rather hilarious. This shows you how thin that body is. Do you know what this is? That is the bottom side of a screw. So this screw for the pickguard goes all the way through into the cavity, so that's kind of funny. Now we've got the corrosion on the pots. But thankfully, we can still read it. 137 stands for CTS, then we have 74 for 1974, and then we don't have the last digit, but it's somewhere within the 30th week of 1974. But this one, we can fully read it after I dusted it off, and it says 1974, 33rd week. So personally, I would call this a 1974, pretty late. But here again, you can see just how thin these wires are. Most Gibson pickups have these nice braided wiring, so you don't have to worry about this stuff snapping, but that is not the case. And if you're curious, how did I learn that they're so fragile? <laughs> the hard way. <laughs> I documented it in this episode. But we've got a strap button down here and right up there, regular Les Paul style. And besides a couple of dings, as we were talking about earlier, this really was quite a fantastic find. 
So now let's move on to our three piece maple neck here. Now this has been glossed over just by somebody playing it. But this neck actually has some lightly figured flame to it. I mean, it's nothing crazy, but it's there. You can also see we have some light impressions on the back of the neck. Maybe somebody had a capo or they were using something else. I'm not too worried about it. You really don't super feel it, but they are there. I was more so worried about brakes, cracks and repairs. So I told you about the other one. That was the cream sparkle that I wanted to buy as a set last year. The back of the neck had to be refinished and I almost still bought it. It just came down to pricing because since it's a bolt on neck, I mean, you could technically find a cleaner neck and throw it on there if you didn't want it to be refinished. But the back of the headstock, I mean, it shows you such a drastic difference. This is how it left the factory, very flat satin. Whereas in the same lighting angles right here, you can see just how glossy that neck is now. But our serial number is 397771. Hey, lucky number seven's there. And we've got the Gibson Deluxe Tuners here. In case you're new to the show, black light tests show you the evenness of the finish. So it should all glow the same unless there's been some sort of a touch up. Had I not noticed that one of these knobs was not like the other, this will show you easily. This one's got the age, this one doesn't. Now they do make modern knobs that will glow. So just because it does glow doesn't mean it's vintage. You really gotta inspect them and know your stuff. But it looks like all these knobs glow just about the same. So I think I'll just pick one out and put it on. But everything looks great on the front of our body here. Everything is looking great here. Ah oh man, that that's beautiful because that's the problem with these maple fret boards is people will play them so much, the finish gets worn through. So I've passed on a lot of these because they were played just a little bit too much for my liking. I mean, the whole idea of my guitar museum is to take you back in time so you can see kind of what they looked like new. That's why I go for the cleaner examples. That doesn't mean I won't have some players grade stuff that people can't play, but I am buying these to preserve them, I guess you could say. But our headstock's looking good, and our back is also looking nice. So this also helps you find and locate chips, nicks, and dings, because this was sold as mint condition multiple times, but nah, you, you can see there's a ding right there. We can see that ding right here, and sometimes black lights can just help you demonstrate that to a buyer. But yeah, I'm really only seeing those two. That doesn't mean that there's not another one somewhere, but I'm not seeing it. And our neck is also looking peachy which again, it's common for them to rub through because they were very thin finishes to begin with. So there we go, all restored back to original here, and it only weighs seven pounds, 10.2 ounces. So let's go ahead and plug this glitter beauty in. plugging this in, I remember why I don't personally like the L6S family. They are ridiculously bright sounding guitars. But I think some of the issue is I try to play these like Les Pauls and, and they're just not. That's not what they were meant to do. I think for this demo, you really have to work your tone knob. I'm just gonna like leave it at seven because then we get tones like this. which is a little bit more palatable to my ears anyways. But a famous user of these was Carlos Santana because he was paid to endorse them. He didn't necessarily like them according to some stories I've read online anyways. <laughs> Thank you. 
So as far as clean tones go, it's all about that neck position. It's still ridiculously bright and clear, but at least it has a little bit more of a oomph to it. <laughs> for stuff. Another user of these was Malcolm Young with ACDC, except for he double cut his, so it looks a little bit different. Now we know all about the L6 Midnight Special, what are my final thoughts on this guitar? Would I suggest it to ya? Honestly, no. As I told you earlier, I've never been a big fan of the L6 family. It feels like they didn't exactly know what they were trying to do with these models. They were just trying to make like a bright sounding thing that maybe it sounds better in like a jazz aspect. But I've always loved the Marauders and S1s because at least they had a mission. They were trying to be Stratocasters and Telecasters. So there's usually a reason why these are a little bit cheaper on the market, but they have been going up in value lately. So that doesn't mean nobody likes these things. Go ahead and give it a try, but now that these are getting more expensive, I would still suggest getting a The Paul. It's the exact same price if you're trying to find a classic rock style instrument, but these are kind of cool and quirky in their own right if you're into 70s history, some Carlos Santana, a little bit of ACDC. I mean, they're not garbage by any means. They're just not my favorite, and I've tried almost everything from the era. But I am happy to have this glitter one in my collection, and we'll find that glitter cream one eventually too. Because 70s sparkles and glitter finishes stock from the factory, yeah, that's cool. All right, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.